Chapter 15 The Terminator's Prisoner The feeling of hardness was the first sensation to enter Li Ma's field of awareness. Solid cement was beneath him, cold and unmoving. The effect of the frigid floor easily penetrated his thin dress shirt. He kept his eyes shut, letting training kick in. It helped attenuate rising fear he felt expanding within his chest, calmed his breathing, slowed the throbbing of his pulse at his temple. I need a plan. Gradually, memories of the events preceding the ambush crept into view like clips from a fractured film reel. He began to concentrate on them with as much care as he could muster in his groggy state. He had been sitting at a corner table in a darkened restaurant, the smell of spicy curry floating in the air. His source seated across from him, the chiming of a device, his vision being swallowed by a tunnel of blackness. He replayed the events prior to that moment several times, wondering how he could have avoided capture. The urge to pity himself was strong. It almost paralyzed his thoughts. No, no. stay sharp stay to escape sharp first. To first. Got, to Got to form a plan. A plan. Pushing the memories aside, he performed a physical scan of his body. Nothing seemed to be broken. Hard to tell on the floor, though. He started to turn himself in an effort to sit up, but stopped after he felt numbness, accompanied by a dull ache on the entire left side of his body. A pain he quickly attributed to the unforgiving and in some places uneven cement floor. His hands were bound tightly in field zip ties behind his back. The range of motion of his shoulders constricted. He dared not attempt more movement. Can't risk further injury now. His ankles were bound, though he could not tell with what. The restraints was loose enough to allow the flow of some blood circulation to the feet. Someone did not want me to lose my mobility. At least not yet. No major injuries. Good. Physical scan completed. Breathing calmed. He kept his eyes closed. It helped him concentrate his hearing. There was music echoing loudly throughout the space. Must be pretty open. Laughter. Hints of conversations. A dog barking, then whining. All of the sounds seemed to blend together in a cacophonous manner, making it difficult to discern one from the other. A wave of dizziness crashed over him, washing away his concentration. Lee relaxed his neck. He realized he had been tensing it as he listened. He let his head rest on the cold floor. Got to conserve my strength. Whatever sedative they had given him still had a hold on his mental and physical faculties. Even tensing the tiny muscles in his neck made him feel lethargic and weak. He heard the sound of boots clomping outside of the area. They approached and stopped for several seconds. Something told him to stay still. He felt eyes observing him. Captors waiting to see his next move. Stay calm. Stay, calm. Stay, Stay quiet. quiet. Think. 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 A revolutionary idea became visible in the rolling fog of his brain. The TP calm. The TP calm. The TP calm. His suit jacket containing his 3D sidearm and his device had been removed. But if it was still in range, he might be able to activate a telepathic link and established contact. Through a monumental effort, he quieted the background noise of his environment and his own anxiety to clear his mind, only thinking of the device. Activate the device. He waited 
for the soft melodic tone that was the signal for a successful link. Nothing. Activate, Activate device. device. Still nothing. He felt his anxiety rising after multiple failed attempts. There's no point trying that anymore. A dry masculine voice destroyed his single-minded concentration. Lee remained motionless, eyes closed, waiting for his captor to make the next move. I know you're awake. <laughs> A slight chuckle echoed in the small space. People don't realize the way their face twists and strains when they try to use those fucking telepathic devices. He laughed again, louder this time. <laughs> it's funny to watch someone use them, especially when there's no device to connect to. He paused for effect to let his captive absorb the words. There was no visible sign of despondency. He's well trained, He's well -trained. but I already knew but that. Already, but already, but already. This should at this least, should at be, least interesting. be interesting. The sound of a click, then turning of old metallic locks, preceded the familiar squeal of a cell door opening. The sound of boots scuffing concrete followed. The definitive slam of the cell door felt louder to Lee's ears than he expected it to. He hadn't anticipated it. That scared him more than his vulnerable position on the floor of the cell. I never liked those things. Give too much away in the face. You should know that for someone in your line of work, Mr. Ma. The condescending tone was close to his face. Lee's eyes remained closed, even though he recognized the man's voice. The drug's effects were beginning to wear thin. He considered making a move. The reminder of his restraints, combined with his lack of knowledge about the layout of the place and troop strength of his kidnapper, made him forfeit the notion. The man had always loved a good interrogation. The subject was so vulnerable and he could do whatever he wanted to them. Time to turn on a little, heat. On a little, heat. little, little heat. Look, Ma, or Lee, yeah, I can call you that now, right, Lee? Understand that this isn't personal, but we can make it that way and get your daughter involved very quickly if you refuse to cooperate. My guys are always ready to work. I just have to say the word and they'll move. Am I making myself clear? Lee managed to conceal a surge of fear. His chest tightened at the thought of any harm happening to Jim Hua. His eyes slid open, an initial act of capitulation. What do you want, Terminator? He barely recognized his drug-induced voice. Even speaking was a struggle. I just want to talk to you as an equal. Is that all right? He said, smiling. Oh, and I would appreciate it if you addressed me as Colonel Kyler Drummle. As much as I enjoy the code name you gave me, as of today, you can consider him terminated off of your source books. The smile was undermined by the edge in his voice. Lee nodded in agreement. He studied Kyler's face. It looked older under the sparse lighting of the cell. Aged grooves from years of sun exposure formed jagged lines of darkness on his face. A permanent scar above his left eyebrow was a light patch of skin in an otherwise even dark sand-colored complexion. His thin eyes and full, yet dry lips had always seemed mismatched in Lee's mind. Both were indicators of his African and Korean heritage, but the man identified with neither culture. He was American, through and through, having spent his formative years in Waco, Texas, before earning his commission as an infantry officer through Baylor University's Army Reserve Officer Training Corps in 2032. By request, he was assigned to the U.S. Army's historic 1st Cavalry Division at the nearby base in Killeen, Texas. 
Throughout his career, he served in Mozambique, Portugal, and the Republic of the Congo. During his final tour in Africa, he was mortally wounded by an improvised explosive device during an enemy ambush while traveling between forward operating bases. His injuries were so great, he died on the operating table for two minutes. Field surgeons pieced him back together, replacing many of his organic organs with artificial ones and swapping his crushed bones with metallic appendages. The result was a Frankenstein of a person, one who existed between the veil of man and machine. Lee could not fathom what it would be like to live with such a condition. But with Kyler standing before him in the gloomy light, his features partially obscured in penumbra, Lee saw the monster looking within. A feral, red-eyed creature stirred from its cave, hungry, following a lengthy slumber. Kyler walked over to Lee and sat him up against the wall with surprising strength. The augmentations must be doing their job well, Lee thought. Sitting upright, he felt less dizzy, but his guard was still up. Comfortable? Kyler asked. I'll go get you some water. You must be dying of thirst. He exited the cell, locking the entrance behind him. Lee took the opportunity to take in his surroundings. The entire cell was no more than 15 by 15 feet in area and was enclosed by a set of thick black bars in the corner walls of the building. Rows of lights of varying luminescent capacity hung from wires and appeared to extend the length of the building. They provided very little illumination over the prison, although Lee couldn't tell if it was by design or just from laziness. He could hear two light alls humming on the other side of the stacks of military equipment crates. The gear blocked his view of the operations, casting long, complete shadows over his cell. From his disadvantaged position on the floor, a set of green olive-colored curtains floated inches above the floor. A pair of slender legs moved back and forth behind them. A dog barked and whimpered beyond the obstruction. Must be his merc base. I need to get out of here. Kyla returned, holding a cylindrical steel flask. He unlocked the cell, entered, approached Lee, then knelt down to offer his prisoner a drink. This will make this it easier, for us, easier for us to talk. Lee eyed the flask with suspicion, then refused it. He thinks it's, he poison. Thinks it's poison. Kyler laughed at the thought. <laughs> Come on, Lee. This isn't a Chinese TV drama. I don't want to poison you. I just want to talk. Look. Kyler took three audible gulps from the shining cylinder, then followed it up with a loud smacking sound. Ah, see? Fresh water from the good old American River. It's safe. He extended it again. Still not fully convinced it was safe, he wanted to refuse again. However, the dryness in his throat informed him he was more dehydrated than he thought so he acquiesced. A small nod of his head signaled to Kyler to put the flask to his lips. He took a few small sips at first, then wrapped his lips around the rim of the container for more. The water tasted metallic, but clean. He let out a few coughs after drinking too fast. Kyler observed him with grave eyes. Lee found it difficult to read his face, he doesn't want me dead, at least for now. A feeling of rejuvenation washed over him. He was ready to find out what this was all about. What do you want to talk about? Kyler set the flask on the floor beside his foot. Look, Lee, at the end of the day, we're both soldiers who've put our asses on the line for decades to help protect the assets and lives of our respective organizations so I won't bullshit you. You're here because this morning at 0930 local, your organization decided to pull the plug on our little agreement. 
His face was stern as he shut out bursts of words in a staccato fashion. An agreement that you helped broker. Lee fixed his drowsy eyes on Kyler's, waiting for more. In exchange for my unit's services, Sirius agreed to provide us with the equipment and resources to be able to sustain the livelihoods of all unit members. Now, as of this morning, our aid has been cut off, and all of a sudden, our effectiveness as a fighting force has been undermined. Lee continued to listen in silence. What does he want? What's your point? You and your people aren't the only ones that are affected by Sirius's order. He managed to keep his voice calm and focused on the conversation, despite his primary concern being Jean Watt's safety. Have they already gotten to her? Kyler shook his head as he let out a bitter laugh. You're absolutely right. I've just spoken to the heads of several of the other street groups. The Panthers, the Zebras, and even the Kings have all lost support promised by Sirius. None are very happy about it. He folded his arms across his chest, then stood to lean back against the wall. It made his semi-muscular chest visible through his coyote brown t-shirt. You, Sirius, and the whole utopia fantasy that you've been playing out since the twenties is about to come to an end. And me and my people, who've done a lot of the wet work to help build the thing up, are left with nothing. Lee scowled. Come on, Kyler. You know how this works. All soldiers throughout history are merely instruments of institutional power, only to be discarded when that power has been achieved or goes away altogether. He paused, letting the words sink in. It gave him time to think about what he would say next, and possibly a way out. You and I are no different in that regard. Kyler nodded slowly. A tightness was building in the lumbar region of his back. The result of years of carrying heavy field gear around manifested in a curved spine that made him look old. Can't waste another augmentation right now. Might need it later on today. He dragged a small metallic chair from the corner. Its screech rumbled across uneven concrete before the sound stopped. The old soldier sat with a softness that betrayed his gruff disposition. The same, no bullshit, expression remained on his face, despite the pain. He did not want to appear weak in front of his former handler. There's some truth to what you say, he admitted. But Sirius is in a position to stop the bleeding, and you being here is us making that request. Like it or not, we have been at war on our own soil for a long time, and the rise of your organization just helped bring to light what was already there and brewing for decades. The cynicism of his words were like acid. What you encountered this morning near the Capitol was just a taste of things to come. Mark my words, there will be more bloodshed. Lee swallowed. The protest. The protest. You incited the protest? Incited? Kyler scoffed. Psh, we didn't have to. I told you, these ills have been building for a long time, and many people, whether they follow the ideals of Sirius or of old world thinking, as you call it, are fed up. They are more than willing to take to the streets in defense against attacks real or perceived on their livelihood. He looks tired, he looks tired. Lee thought. I guess he has a few augmentations has a few left in him today. Left. Kyler stared blankly at the floor as he said, The worst thing is that some people are out there just because they have nothing better to do with their lives. Those privileged and entitled ones who have more than enough food on their plates, whether it be through bartering or wealth accumulation from the old world, are the most despicable in my eyes. His eyes rose to meet Lee's. Their kind has been able to survive and thrive since the dawn of the Internet age at the beginning of the century. And now, their inability to believe in anything outside of themselves has led us to where we are now. A society in chaos, where half lives off the backs of the other half. It's bullshit, and I'm not going to have it anymore. 
A litany of questions and statements rolled in Lee's mind that had he not been a prisoner, he would have used to counter several of his captors' arguments. The one-sided conversation was fitting for a man who thought he had all of the answers. I can't waste any more time here. Surely Rodan must be on his way by now. Outside of the cell, Lee heard hurried steps approach. A young, dark-skinned male with a scant mustache scribbled under his nose and sad eyes stood just before the cell door. His eyes flashed to Lee, then quickly back to Kyler. Sir, we have a problem that we need your help with. With deliberate movement, Kyler rotated his head in the young man's direction, but his eyes remained focused on Lee. Can it wait? I'm in the middle of a conversation. I'm afraid not, Colonel. All right. Placing both hands on his knees, he made a concerted effort to raise himself out of the tiny chair. Upon standing as upright as his back would allow, he shrugged his shoulders. Pardon the interruption, Lee. I guess we'll have to continue our conversation another time. The youth who delivered the message opened the cell door, then Kyler moved to leave. Lee used the brief opportunity to ask a burning question. My daughter, is she safe? Kyler looked over his shoulder. He had already taken two steps out of the cell. For now, yes. And if your leadership cooperates with us, she will remain so. We don't want to involve innocent civilians in our fight, but we will if forced to. The messenger allowed his commander to pass, then clicked the lock shut with a single key, taking no time to look in his prisoner's direction. Lee's head drooped with helplessness. He knew that any request Kyler demanded of the serious leadership would go unanswered and unfulfilled. Not as a consequence of his unit's radical actions, but simply because they no longer existed. When the order had been published that morning by Mr. Cooney, the organization had become a headless entity forced to thrash around and determine its own future without vision or foresight to guide it. He knew that Kyler's promise of more bloodshed would come to pass. He just hoped Chief Hua wouldn't be caught in the middle of it.